and these are in listen only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Tani Samiski. I'm an entomology specialist with UMass Extension, and I'm excited to welcome you all here again today, or if it's your, your first time joining us, thank you so much um, for joining on to our Invasive Insect Webinar Series. So this series is made possible uh, through a collaboration between our Landscape Nursery and Urban Forestry Program, as well as UMass Extension's Fruit Program. And uh, these webinars are freely available to you through support from the U.S. Department of Agriculture through a specialty crop block grant program. So we thank them uh, for that support. I also have here with me today Jeffrey Jouet, who is assisting with uh, the technical aspects of GoToWebinar. And uh, Jeffrey, can I bother you to advance the, to the next slide? All right, great. So just um, a couple of reminders about the pesticide and association credit process for today's broadcast. Um, again, all instructions for receiving pesticide credit. So for Massachusetts categories 26, 27, 29, 35, 36, and our applicator's license or core license, um, are, are, are available as well as the association credits. Those will be shared at the end of this webinar. Um, so please remain on the webinar until the very end to receive instructions um, and to take the quiz for the pesticide credit. And this quiz is only required for those of you who are looking for pesticide credit for today. If you sign off the webinar um, before taking the quiz, unfortunately, you will not be allowed to retake it and will not be awarded the credit. So again, please um, stay with us. Also, a couple of reminders as we've learned um, some uh, technical um, issues through the course of these webinars. Uh, those of you who are viewing them on a cell phone, um, just please be careful um, and cautious uh, using the back button when you're trying to take the quiz, as we have had some folks um, get kicked out and were unable to finish the quiz. Um, and then those of you on desktops and laptops, just be aware of pop-up blockers. We had last week some folks uh, with issues be because of those. All right, I think um, that's all I'll say for now. Uh, for pesticide and association credits, again, I'll remind everyone at the end of uh, today's broadcast. I do want to remind um, our audience to take a look at the, the GoToWebinar dashboard and the questions section in particular. So if you click on that, um, expand that, that little menu option there, you can type in questions that you have uh, during today's broadcast, and I will do my best to answer those that I can, um, and also will collect um, questions that I can then share with today's speaker at the end of, of the pre presentation. All right, so without further ado, I will swap um, over to today's presenter so we can see her screen and introduce um, to everyone uh, Emily Swackhammer with uh, Penn State Extension. She's a horticultural educator who will be here uh, speaking with us today uh, about green industry and homeowner response to the spotted lantern lanternfly in Pennsylvania. So uh, please take it away, Emily, and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, it's great to be here. Thank you for inviting me. So we're gonna talk about uh, the spotted lanternfly today and the green industry and homeowner response here in Pennsylvania. Um, I understand there's been uh, some other opportunities for you all to learn about spotted lanternfly there. Um, so some of this might be review, but I think it's important for everybody to be able to identify this insect in all of its life stages um, and understand the life cycle. So hopefully you're all watching for it this summer. Uh, we hope it doesn't get to Massachusetts, but um, you know, it's uh, been moving in through New Jersey and, and uh, we wouldn't be surprised if you'd find it. So it's important for you to know that. So the spotted lanternfly is a plant hopper. And here's a really good picture of one of the adults. It's native to Asia. It was found 
first found in southeastern Pennsylvania in the United States in 2014. It has now spread to six states and it has been detected in four additional states. So I wanted to just quickly remind everybody that um, invasive species go both ways across the world. So we do have a lot of invasive species here from Asia, but Asia is dealing with invasive species that are coming from North America. So I looked it up and I found some interesting things. Um, they list, uh, this is a Google uh, Wikipedia article, um, they list two amphibians as invasive in Asia, including the American bullfrog. There are fish that are invasive there, including our rainbow trout from North America. Uh, there are invasive raccoons in Asia. Um, the common snapping turtle is invasive in Asia, and there are 55 insects, including the fall webworm. So um, it's a two-way street, it's a global economy, and I feel for the people of Asia, I don't think I'd want to deal with invasive raccoons if that wasn't a creature you were used to. So. I just think it's an important point to remember. So the spotted lanternfly distribution map is um, housed by the New York State Integrated Pest Management Program. And this is the most recent map. It shows uh, in blue where there are established infestations of spotted lanternfly. In Pennsylvania, we had 14 counties in the southeastern corner um, under quarantine, known infestations for about two years, and then in early March, our Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture expanded it to include 12 additional counties, and now we have 26 counties in blue. So you see there's some that are out there in the western part of Pennsylvania. Um, we have not found it in the Allegheny Highlands yet, and there's some speculation that maybe uh, the cold temperatures of the winter are too severe there, or maybe the season length is too short. Um, but we have a lot of people looking for it uh, this year to see if we do find it in those areas. Of course, it's in New Jersey, Delaware, parts of Maryland, Virginia, uh, West Virginia. And then the pink dots show where the uh, spotted lanternfly has been found, but um, after a detection was made, the authorities went in and really scouted and they were not able to find an infestation. So um, there's uh, one dot there in Massachusetts where one was intercepted. Please be watching for it and keep watching this website for information as things change. This map also um, reflects quarantines that are underway and that are being enforced by the respective Department of Agriculture in those states. So at the moment, that's how the quarantine situation is working. It's not, uh, you know, there's no national quarantine yet, but. Um, but be aware if you're traveling across state lines that there's also regulatory concerns. This is a map that was published in the Journal of Economic Entomology that shows uh, the um, predicted distribution of where lanternfly could exist. So you see that it does stretch up into New York and New England, um, out into the Midwest and um, the Western um, part of the country. So a lot of big production areas um, have the climate that we think spotted lanternfly could thrive in. So this is of great concern. The spotted lanternfly has a really broad host range and that makes it kind of unusual, but it does have some preferred hosts and specifically it loves Alanthus altissima, which is commonly known as the tree of heaven or TOH. And I have a little star there to uh, just remember that I'm going to talk about how we're using its fondness for the tree of heaven as a weapon against it. But it's important for everybody to know what tree of heaven looks like and be able to identify it and distinguish it from some other trees that look very similar. So um, black walnut, even staghorn sumac can look very similar. The picture shows one leaf of Alanthus altissima. And it's a compound leaf, but the leaf margins are smooth. So black walnut and staghorn sumac have a serrated leaf margin. That is one of the best ways to tell them apart. Just another picture of many fourth instar nymphs feeding on a tree of heaven, a young shoot, very succulent. They like that kind of material. And then um, a list of other preferred hosts. So the spotted lanternfly loves grape, 
black walnut, silver and red maple, birch, willow, staghorn sumac, rose, especially in its nymph stage. Rose is almost an indicator plant. We often find it in an area first on rose in those early life stages. But watch all of these trees on the list, and I have others. So it's an insect from Asia. It loves a lot of Asian ornamental trees like the Vodia, um, armor cork tree. So watch things like that. Um, it is kind of good news though that we have not recorded substantial feeding on any conifers. We have seen them sit on a conifer now and then, but they don't really seem to like to feed on any conifers like pine or spruce or any of the other conifers. A little bit of good news. So how are we using the tree of heaven as a trap to kill spotted lantern fly? This is a, a little graphic that shows that uh, the majority, this is a stand of tree of heaven. The majority of those trees will be killed and um, you have to usually use herbicide to do this because if you just cut a tree of heaven down, they'll re-sprout from the roots and from the trunks and you're often left with more than you started with. So you kill the tree of heaven according to the recommendations. And then these remaining few trees are treated with a systemic insecticide that makes the whole tree toxic to lanternfly. And when the lanternfly um, adults are moving around, they often fly to Tree of Heaven to feed. They'll feed on these treated trees and die. And these trapped trees can kill hundreds of thousands of insects. So they just keep coming and dying and coming and dying and piling up and piling up. Um, it's very satisfying to kill so many lanternflies with such a small amount of pesticide application. There are a lot of uh, trees that are being treated using this method by our Department of Agriculture, both our Pennsylvania and our United States Department of Ags. Um, but it is a tree by tree control method. And we really know that we need to find some other control methods for large scale uh, landscape wide application. So we're working on that. Well, why are we so worried about spotted lanternfly? Um, I think this picture says a lot. This is a grapevine that I, or a grape yard, a vineyard that I went to visit with some of my colleagues this uh, fall, last fall in October. And this is a block of Gewurztraminer vines that were heavily fed upon by spotted lanternfly. And, um, you know, they didn't really come back the next year. So the lanternfly seems to prefer some cultivars of grapes over others but we're not really sure, it's hard to measure how much of the death is directly attributed to the spotted lanternfly feeding pressure or if it reduces their ability to survive the winters. You know, we're trying to figure all that out. So there's a lot of research going on in grapes. Um, we have a lot of wine grapes um, produced in Southeastern Pennsylvania, it's a very important crop. Um, the Northwestern part of Pennsylvania has a lot of juice grape production. So um, we are really concerned about lanternfly and trying to get everybody to act to control it um, to protect our, our grape industry. But what about trees? Well, so far we've only seen spotted lanternfly kill tree of heaven, which you know everybody says that's a good thing because tree of heaven is an, is an invasive species, it's a weed. And this shows a picture of um, some tree of heaven that were killed after about two years of heavy feeding by spotted lanternfly. I did find evidence of borers in these trees, so there were some secondary invaders. We have also seen spotted lanternfly really go after our black walnuts. And um, so here are some pictures that were taken on August 6th, very early in the season for the trees to be defoliating and that's a sign of the amount of stress that's been caused. So the lanternfly nymphs love walnuts, and then um, the trees, the seedlings here defoliated. I went back and took a picture of one of them um, the next year, and it had totally killed the tip, a side shoot had developed, but some of these seedlings were killed. So, um, so it can kill tree seedlings, and this is a walnut tree that shows the um, branch dieback that can be caused by spotted lanternflies feeding on high numbers on the branch tips. So spotted lanternfly definitely hurts plants, but to date it has only killed Alanthus altissima, the tree of heaven, small tree saplings, and grapevines, but not other plants. 
So this is really important for garden centers and tree care companies to um, understand and help people because we have had a, a bit of panic where people think it's, you know, a spotted lanternfly will kill a lot of trees and it's just not the case. But spotted lanternfly definitely stresses our trees. So what really is the risk from spotted lanternfly? Well, the feeding damage outright is a risk. There's this nuisance issue where the spotted lanternfly congregates in high numbers and then creates honeydew and sooty mold, which I'm going to show you some pictures of in a little bit. And then there's this whole quarantine issue. So where you fit into this diagram, you know, really depends on a lot of different factors. The producers, the great producers are very concerned about feeding damage. The homeowners um, are often mostly concerned about the nuisance factor. The nursery producers who want to ship their plants around the quarantine requirements are very concerned about complying with those, the quarantine order. And then, you know, there's all these places where it overlaps. So there's a lot of risk and a lot of different concerns. Well, um, Dr. Jason Harper and his associates at Penn State did a study um, in 2019 and you can find it through this link. It's uh, published with the Center for Rural Pennsylvania. They were the funders. They took data from the 2017 Census of Agriculture and they surveyed crop production experts. They wanted to estimate the annual direct economic impact of spotted lantern flood damage, damage on Pennsylvania agriculture. And they calculated this in a variety of ways, but this was kind of the um, expected scenario. It wasn't the worst case scenario. It was what they think is really happening out there um, in the 14 county quarantine zone. And remember, this was published last year before Pennsylvania expanded the quarantine to now include 26 counties. But for the numbers for the 14 counties, they estimated the annual direct economic impact was going to be $13.1 million in those 14 counties. The adjacent counties, all the Pennsylvania counties touching those counties, 7.7 .7 million, and then statewide, 42.6 million. And they were focused on production agriculture. So in their equations, the losses were projected to fall, especially on nursery operators, grape growers, and Christmas tree growers. So it's a long um, study, but there is like an executive summary that's very interesting and it is all publicly available. So if you're interested in the economic impact, we finally have um, some really good information to look at. Well, part of the reason why spotted lanternfly is so difficult to control and it's so hard for garden centers and tree care companies to um, come up with a real answer for people is that they move through the season. So this is a chart from our, one of our fact sheets where it shows the host that we often find them on and then what time of the year we're finding them. And, and this is not by any means a complete list, but we often find them on rows early in the season, on grape and tree of heaven throughout the season, on black walnut and butternut um, in the nymph stage, June and July, but as soon as they turn to adults, they, they move, they go somewhere else to feed. And where they wind up is often on river birch, willow, sumac, or silver or red maple. So you have these shifts of populations as the season progresses. This is a picture from um, Heather Leach, my colleague, that, um, you know, it's an aerial shot. It's a heat map showing where the stress of um, spotted lanternfly damage is occurring in a vineyard. So on the top edge of that field, you can see the heat map shows there's a lot of stress on those vines and in other parts of the field, not as much. The um, edge effect is because that wood line that you can see um, above, there are lots of lanternfly living on preferred host plant material in that wood line. And then when they need to feed a lot in the fall when they're, you know, adults and developing their eggs, they fly into the vineyard and they, you know, they find vineyard or uh, grapevines that are uh, suitable and land and start to feed. So in vineyards, and, and Heather works uh, with a lot of our commercial growers, she's saying that the spatial distribution in your vineyard is not equal 
And using border sprays can be a really good um, method to try to manage them. Only use full sprays when you really need them. So it does mean that you need to scout multiple times um, and stay on top of where the populations are because they're moving around. Well, how does this translate to landscapes and residential areas? That is um, something that we're wrestling with right now. Um, if you know that your property is up against um, an area where there's a lot of tree of heaven, um, you might expect that the populations could get really high. And when the Leonard flies, especially in the adult stage, start to move around, they very well may come into onto your property. So um, it's not just what's happening in your landscape, it's this whole area-wide scenario that we're looking at. The other thing that um, tree care professionals and garden centers really need to remember to tell people about lanternfly is you can't stop them from moving onto a property. So this shows three pictures of the base of a silver maple that was treated with a systemic insecticide. So it was treated um, in early August, and then as the lanternfly adults were moving around, this was one of the trees that they just really preferred, a very favorite tree. They kept coming and feeding and dying, and coming and feeding and dying. And you see the piles of dead bodies piling up at the base of the tree. So this is a very effective way. It's using the silver maple as a trap tree. It's a very effective way of killing a lot of spotted lanternfly. But we had... Um, homeowners being upset because they thought if, you know, if you treated your tree, if you, you paid someone to come treat your tree or you did it yourself, um, they were thinking that they wouldn't have any more problems. And this pile of dead lanternflies got to be inches deep and they were rotting and decomposing and getting smelly and more would come and come and come. And, and it just wasn't giving the homeowner that, um, you know, expected result. So you have to prepare people for this inevitability if you use a preferred tree as a trap tree using systemic insecticides. So let's just go through some of the biology and the life cycle. Um, I know it's probably a review for some of you, but uh, I wanna get everybody on the same page. So it is a plant hopper. It feeds on plant sap through a piercing sucking mouth part. And we've drawn a box around that straw-like piercing sucking mouth part. And when it feeds on the sap, it, it um, draws a lot into its body and it excretes honeydew out the other end, which has um, a lot of sugar left in it. And then sooty mold grows on that honeydew. So this is a picture of the life cycle and I'll show you some real pictures um, here in a minute, but I wanna just take you through it. The only life stage that will overwinter is the egg stage. So the eggs are present for a long period of time. They start to be laid in very late September, you know, through October, all the way up until the first killing frost. And when we get that killing frost, all of the adults are killed. So um, in most years that happens in November in Pennsylvania. So the eggs are present all the way from October until June. They begin to hatch as early as April in some sheltered spots. Most of them hatch in May. Uh, they've been hatching a little later this season, so we're still seeing hatch happening now in June. When they hatch, they're small and they're black with white spots, and they go through these different stages called instars. So um, the first, second, and third instar are black with white spots. The fourth instar has this beautiful red coloration, and they're about a quarter of an inch long. Um, they have incomplete metamorphosis, so there's no cocoon or pupa stage. They go right from that fourth instar stage into the adult stage. And then the adults are present starting at the very end of July and up until the first killing frost. The egg laying starts in September. So the adults are really present and feeding, and they feed voraciously in these big groups, high numbers sometimes. And they feed um, from... Uh, the end of July, all the way into the end of September until they start laying eggs and they need a lot of energy to produce those eggs. So this is a stage that causes a lot of concern. They're very visible and they become quite a nuisance. I wanna make sure you all know how to identify the egg masses. This is a picture of an egg mass that's pretty freshly deposited. The female lays her eggs in rows and she covers them then with a secretion from her body that provides some sort of protection to the eggs. 
the secretion when it comes out of her body, it's white and wet, but it dries down to this gray color and you can see it starts developing these cracks in the surface. Now, often the females will miss some of the eggs with, um, by covering them. So here you can see some of the uncovered eggs as well. There's an average of 35 eggs per egg mass and um, they can be laid on virtually any solid object. So I went back and took a picture of the same egg mass um, in the late winter, the following late winter. And you can see that it has desiccated, there's cracks in the covering. Its appearance has changed and they get to be very hard to see. It, it, it almost appears like a piece of mud on a tree or something. And, and depending on the lighting, they can be very hard to see. Those eggs that were not covered, there, there still will be viable eggs in, um, at least in our climate in Pennsylvania that can hatch from those eggs. So just because they're uncovered doesn't mean that they you know, would necessarily be killed by winter temperatures. So I wanted to show you some pictures of some highly infested areas. Uh, this is in Berks County, Pennsylvania. This is a tree of heaven. For some reason, the females just loved the sight on this tree. It's a warmer exposure. The tree trunk has kind of a curve to it. So there's a little bit of protection there and they laid hundreds and hundreds of eggs there. So this picture shows how the rainwater has kind of washed down over these egg masses. It's the same tree, just a close up. And as the rainwater passed over the um, covering of the eggs, you can see it's washed some of it away and you see the eggs kind of right through the covering. But you can also see some areas where the female didn't, didn't cover parts of those egg masses. So the eggs will hatch in the spring, and this is what we're seeing in my part of Pennsylvania right now. The first instar nymphs are out and they have tender uh, piercing sucking mouth parts. They, they need to feed on tender parts of the plants. So on leaves, you'll often see them tapped right into the vein of a leaf, the petioles, um, and they also feed on herbaceous uh, like succulent plant stems. This is a picture that uh, one of my friends, Carl Gardner, took where he, he came upon three Leonard fly in stars, and this is the first, second, and third in star all lined up for the photo opportunity. It's um, on an Asiatic bittersweet. So that is another invasive plant that is here that was brought here from Asia. They really like that plant. So it's another one to be watching. But I just love this picture. I, I, I'm so proud that he caught them all three at once like this. And then this is a picture showing that uh, fourth instar. So after they um, molt from the third to the fourth, they develop this red coloration. This is on a young tree of heaven stem. It must have been a very healthy tree with lots of sap because they really liked it. And it was just red with insects, the whole tree all up and down. And then this is a video. I hope this works with the internet speed we're working with. But this is just to show you what these landscapes look like in the late summer. You have lanternflies feeding, sooty mold, our honeydew coming down, sooty mold growing on the honeydew, stinging insects coming because of that sweetness. They like to collect it. Lanternfly groups feeding right through the bark of the mature bark of the tree and creating wounds and sap leaking out of the tree. And this is just, it also develops this really characteristically like sour smell. So very much of a nuisance um, in a landscape. This is a tree of heaven, but you can get the same kind of um, lanternfly party scene going on on uh, some of our ornamental landscape trees like the maples and sycamores and so on. So this shows um, red maples in a, a commercial um, office development. And you see the group at the bottom of that tree, the sooty mold around it. But if you look up, you also see groups of lanternflies, you know, going all the way up the trunk. Lots of lanternflies. So then they lay their eggs. And the, this is one of the big problems. They will lay their eggs on virtually any solid object. So I got this slide from Heather Leach, and uh, she has this great collection of pictures. Um, yeah, they laid eggs on a light bulb. Can you believe it? On the fabric of lawn furniture, on the rubber of tires, but I've seen them lay on the rusty metal of the wheel of tires. That's especially concerning because if that was attached to a vehicle that could be, you know, taken down the road, you could easily spread a population to a new area. 
This um, in the middle on the bottom is the underside of a planter box and it was on a deck and they, they laid on the underside that protected side. So for the picture, it was flipped over and then a piece of firewood just coated in lanternfly eggs. So of course, burn local firewood, don't move firewood around. Um, this is yet another insect that can be transmitted that way. So biological control, there are predators and parasites that will eat them. So we know spiders, praying mantids, wheel bugs, um, you know, some of the general predators that we have will, will attack them and eat them. There are also some small, tiny parasitic wasps that um, we know there's one that is already here. It's naturalized um, from Asia. It was introduced to try to control gypsy moth. So that was observed um, parasitizing spotted lanternfly eggs. And then the USDA has a program where they are exploring the native range of spotted lanternfly. And they have brought two parasitic wasps and they exist in quarantine now in the USDA facility. And there are people that are doing a lot of excellent research to try to figure out if that could possibly be released to help control lanternfly here as a biological control. That kind of work takes a really long time to do. So it's, it's you know, down the road, we hope it works out, but um, for more immediate needs, we realize that there are some fungal pathogens that attack spotted lanternfly. So um, all along in the infested area, we have been finding dead insects that have fungal tissue growing out of them. And um, Eric Clifton and Ann Hayek from Cornell have done a lot of work in this area. And this is one that they're particularly interested in. So Bavaria bassiana is this fungus and you see it growing. Um, it's killed the, the insects um, and it's growing out of their bodies and making its fungal tissue there. It's this really great picture coming out of the joints and, and of the, of the insects exoskeleton. And um, Bavaria bassiana already exists as a commercial product that you can buy that is labeled for use on ornamentals. In Pennsylvania, it's a site use requirement. So we already have this and it is legal to try to use it. But what we need to do next is get efficacy data to see if it really works well enough to add it to our recommendations. So um, there's a big project going on right now in Pennsylvania um, a lot of researchers involved in it, looking at the efficacy of the Varia Bassiana products, looking at the application methods, looking at the potential off-target effects, which we hope there are none, but we're going to be trying to quantify that. And, um, and hopefully by the end of the season, we're gonna have some really good information about the Varia Bassiana products as a possible biological control to recommend. So, we use integrated pest management um, to manage all kinds of insects and diseases. And this is the IPM triangle for spotted lanternfly. So we start at the bottom of the triangle using the least toxic method. And then as you know, we make our decisions, we can proceed to use more toxic options if we need to. So to put this into context for um, spotted lanternfly, cultural practices that are available are to promote the health of your plant and eliminate favorite plant hosts. So eliminate tree of heaven, eliminate Asiatic or Oriental bittersweet, um, and really think about the plants that are in your environment. Physical and mechanical methods that exist would be to destroy egg masses and use traps. I'm gonna show you some more pictures of those. Biological control methods include using, well, allowing predators that are out there already to encourage them, you know, don't kill them. Um, this parasitoid idea, and then possibly fungi that kill insects. The, um, the Bavaria bassiana is naturally occurring. So in 2018, we had a lot of rain and we had a lot of Bavaria bassiana killed spotted lanternfly. So um, in some cases, the biological control piece, you know, happens. And in some cases, we augment nature to uh, use it to our advantage. And then the chemical control piece. Um, the lower toxicity level of the chemical piece includes the biorational products, soaps, oils, neem, pyrethrins. 
And spotted lanternfly is pretty easy to kill even with these bio-rational bio products. They work pretty well. And then of course, the last thing to uh, consider would be the conventional um, chemicals, and that would include contact and systemic insecticides. So the other part about using integrated pest management and choosing pest management methods is um, making sure you're using the appropriate method at the uh, correct time of the year. So this is from our fact sheet, Spotted Lanternfly Management for Homeowners. And um, we are suggesting that people can use all of these control options uh, down the side. So don't move any life stages that, you know, year round. Scrape and smash eggs when they are present. So as long as, um, you know, the eggs are viable and you destroy them, you can kill lantern flies. Use tree traps. Um, and I'm going to talk about that with pictures here in a minute. Um, use contact insecticides. And of course, you want to do that after the lantern flies have hatched. And then you want to avoid bloom because of pollinator concerns. You can use systemic applications of, um, and we are currently recommending two systemic insecticides that we know are effective. Imidacloprid works very well if you can get it, as long as you can get it into the tree. And the time period to apply that would be May, June, and July. It takes a little longer for it to get into the tree as long as you're um, using like a soil drench method. You can also inject imidacloprid. And then systemic application of dinotefuran. We, again, do this after bloom because of concerns of pollinators. And we suggest using the dinotefuran later in the season. So the application window for the systemic insecticides overlaps in July. And um, this is an important thing for garden centers to hopefully be explaining to people. So they're using these insecticides effectively and um, getting the results that are desired. So let's go through some of these um, mechanical methods. This is scraping eggs and you can scrape them off of whatever object you find them on. The best way to kill them is to scrape them into a container and add um, rubbing alcohol and that will kill the eggs. So you can also just smash them and they, they have like a liquidy center, so you know you're killing them. Um, we don't recommend just scraping them onto the ground. We'd rather see you smash them. That way you know they're really dead. So you can do this, um, but this has led to a lot of questions from tree care companies. You know, can we spray for the egg masses? Because the egg masses um, can be anywhere. This picture shows where they are on a cinder block, but they could be way up high in the tree. You can't reach them. So uh, Dr. Greg Krawcheck at Penn State has done work on um, ovicidal um, products. And this is from one of his experiments. And he tried a lot of oils. You know, you always hear about using oils to smother eggs. And at the rates, at the labeled rates for, he's a fruit researcher. So at the labeled rates for his fruit labels, um, they, it really didn't, didn't work very well. Um, Lohr's band there that did work very well you see a very low egg hatch rate, that's chlorpyrifos, and that is not um, allowed for use in landscapes and would not be sold at garden centers. So it's really not a good option for the green industry. So Greg Krawcheck is continuing to do work. He has maybe some better uh, encouraging results with some higher rates of dormant oils. So stay tuned, we're still working to try to find an ovicide. But then another mechanical method you could use are the tree traps. And this is a picture showing sticky bands. It's uh, basically fly paper that's wrapped around the trunks of trees. The nymphs will get blown out of the trees and they fall to the ground and they climb, they, they walk to the nearest plant and climb back up because they have to feed on tender plant tissue. So you can see these sticky bands are filling from the bottom up. You can catch thousands and thousands and thousands of lanternflies this way. And a lot of homeowners are protecting their trees with sticky bands. Um, a lot of garden centers are supplying these. So it's something that, um, you know, if we have garden centers listening in, that might be something that, you know, if it ever gets to you, you might want to stop. The problem with sticky bands is that you can catch unintended creatures. We've had cases of birds and, and some other creatures being caught, and nobody wants that to happen. 
So this is a different style of tree band where it's um, a sticky, um, the sticky part is inward facing and it creates like a lip on the, so the lantern flies climb up that, they get to, um, they go underneath the plastic part and they get to the white part, which is like a barrier. And then they um, get stuck to the inward facing sticky lip. Um, this is a product that's available through uh, one commercial company and they have um, like a um, network of distributors across the Northeast and South to, uh, to market these. So it's a nicer option because fewer birds get tangled up in this. But uh, a lot of garden centers are supplying this uh, product, which is a, a yellow color fly paper. And um, so we're trying to help people that want to use these, use them safely. In the picture on the left, we have cut them down into a narrow strip. So there's not a lot of exposed sticky surface for you know, birds to get against. And as this fills up with lantern flies, it would fill from the bottom. It just needs to be changed more frequently. So it makes your roll of sticky paper go three times as long if you cut it into thirds. And it does provide a little bit of protection for the wildlife. The picture on the right shows a variety of wire cages that our master gardeners have been making to put around the tree and it would hold any um, wildlife away from that sticky surface. So we really encourage people to use protection like that. And then there's a new kind of trap, it's called a circle trap. Um, it's been used for years for pecan weevil and some other um, insects that climb up the trunks of trees. But uh, the USDA has developed this as a trap that works very well for spotted lanternfly. And there's no sticky surface to um, catch something else. So um, I have a fact sheet that I wrote about how to make them yourself. And this is one that I made um, pretty inexpensively with some hot glue and uh, old netting from a canopy that we were throwing out and some milk jug lids and, and a Ziploc uh, type bag. So if you're interested in making spotted lanternfly circle traps, um, there's a how-to on our website. And then you have this problem where people are using the sticky bands and at the adult stage, the adults tend to avoid them. They no longer need to climb up to the top of the tree. So they tend to feed right on the bark, you know, below it, and they don't need to cross that and they're happy. But the a uh, person who owns this tree is not happy. And then we have people doing uh, kind of, you know, dangerous things with household products. So they get these home remedies, they're rummaging around in the garage or the medicine cabinet under the sink. And we want um, people to say, no, don't do this. These are unsafe for humans and, humans and pets. They um, are toxic to beneficial insects. They may harm your plants. Some of them are flammable and this is illegal really don't want people using home remedies and this is rampant. So we need everybody to get this message out. We really need to use EPA registered insecticides that have labels and have been tested for safety. So what are those products? Well, um, you know, the first thing is read the label and make sure that it is the right product for where you are going to use it and allowed to be used in your state. And then consider the equipment that you have. Um, you know, if you're using a backpack sprayer, you're probably not going to be very successful in spraying a big tree. And I'm concerned about drift that might be coming down on the person that's doing that. But then we have a whole long list of things that have been tested. These are all found on our extension uh, spotted lanternfly website. So um, we know that the traditional insecticides, carbaryl malathion, can kill lanternfly, but of course they're the highest toxicity. Pyrethroids, they work very well. They pro also provide the longest residual. So it is a good choice for tree care companies that need that longer residual window. For homeowners, pyrethrins work very well. Neem oil, spinosad, insecticidal soap, botanical oils. And I have Bavaria bassiana with a question mark on here because we don't really know how effective it might be. I think it's probably gonna be very weather dependent because it's a fungus. So if it's wet, it should work better, but we don't have that data yet. Um, but I would encourage homeowners trying to combat lanternfly to try some of these lower toxicity contact sprays first. And then of course the systemics. 
And the two that have worked well in our efficacy trials are dinotefuran and imidacloprid. The um, dinotefuran is what's being used in the trap tree um, establishment across Pennsylvania. So another thing for if you're working with homeowners and residents, I get asked about toxicity of pesticides a lot, but the other part of the risk equation is exposure. So I, I ask them, you know, if you want to use an insecticide, how much might you be exposed to? What is the length of time you were exposed? How often do you use it? And how are you exposed? You know, is it being, um, are you somehow not using the correct PPE? Are you, um, you know, being exposed on parts of your skin that are more absorptive? All of these other things that um, I find I need to interject this into the equation. Toxicity is definitely, you know, a concern and a big part of risk, but exposure is the other part. So take that message out there um, to the people you work with. And then of course, encourage everybody to protect pollinators. Um, we're especially concerned about the potential for the systemic insecticides to carry over into the flowers of the early blooming plants like maple. So for the tree care companies, um, I. I went and talked to a lot of them um, to find out what they are, are using as their program, what is their, their uh, strategy. So many of them are using contact sprays in the season, and this is to reduce the nuisance effect um, problems that people have in their landscapes. Many companies are using pyrethroids or carbaryl. They both have pretty good residual activity. And then a lot of tree care companies are using systemic insecticides um, some are using systemic imidacloprid in the early spring or the late fall. The late fall we're concerned about, about possible carryover, especially in the maples into the flowers. They're using systemic dinotefuran in midsummer to early fall. And many companies are offering both systemics and contacts. And I'm not really sure if that's always warranted, um, but I'm going to talk at the very end about some of the complexities of different scenarios. Um, so landscape tree care company um, companies have a lot of differences. The number of contact sprays that they were marketing ranged from one to five per year. Um, and again, you know, like is five sprays really warranted? I think in some cases, and, and here in Southeastern Pennsylvania, there's the, the industry does tend to hold each other kind of accountable. And I think the companies that were overselling sprays and products may have gotten some pushback from some of the other companies. But this is just to tell you what, what the range is. Um, some are treating select trees and some are treating every tree in the landscape. Uh, the application methods and the timing that they're using vary. Some are using multiple applications of systemic products. And, you know, again, some of that isn't quite congruent with the label directions. Some offer scouting and egg destruction services, um, but I, I'm seeing fewer and fewer companies that do that. Some are offering tree banding services. Again, it's time consuming, so I see fewer and fewer companies doing that. Some will set up tree of heaven trap trees. And then, you know, some companies provide pollinator safety information and others um, don't. So there's a lot of differences. Um, I wanted to just mention some cases where systemic insecticides were used and they didn't work. So we had um, some cases where dinotefuran was used very early in the season and the efficacy wore off by the time the adult stage was posing a nuisance in that landscape. And the label of that product said it may only be used once per year. So you want to time dinotefuran applications carefully. Um, we had imidacloprid used as a soil drench in the end of August in a very dry year, and it just never got up into the tree. So we got no efficacy in that case. And it was used according, this was a homeowner product, but it was used according to the label with the appropriate amount of water according to the label, and it still didn't work. Um, Dinotefuran was used as a bark spray without an adjuvant in red maple, and we had some failure there. Um, but I'm not sure if incorrect application and mixing methods or methods may have contributed to that case. So uh, if you're doing a bark spray, the label will tell you how much water should be applied. 
and it should not run down the trunk of the tree into the soil. So in some cases, depending on how textured the bark is, if you're doing a bark spray, you may need to apply it once and then wait until it dries and then apply it again to get the right dose on that tree. And tree care companies uh, rarely have enough time to fit that into their production schedule. So um, be aware of that. And then we have companies that are selling fertilization as part of their lanternfly program. And we have some evidence that suggests that fertilizing a tree might actually make it more attractive to spotted lanternfly. They really seem to like to feed on vigorous trees, you know, that are just very, um, very healthy with lots of sap to feed on. So we're gonna do some work on this too and try to figure out if fertilization is, is something that should be in these programs. So what are our future plans? Well, we know there are endless scenarios for people uh, to deal with. And so as an extension person, I talk to homeowners that have, you know, these endless scenarios, different numbers of trees, different trees in their neighborhood. Um, you know, they have different degrees of tolerance and, and that would be their threshold for where they want treatment done. And somehow we're trying to work to simplify these recommendations. The other part of that is how to teach others to give good advice. I work with our garden centers um, who are training their employees to help people that come to them for advice. And we're faced with this really complicated insect and this landscape-wide management perspective. So we're working on this. Um, this is from my colleague, Amy Corman, and this is not anything published yet, but we're, we're trying to put it into some sort of a matrix where we're assessing the risk of spotted lanternfly. So we're looking at the severity of the infestation. She has these different levels, acceptable, tolerable, undesirable, intolerable, and then the likelihood of factors contributing to tree stress. So how much does spotted lanternfly favor it? Um, does it have other stressors? Um, is it um, close to other very vulnerable plants that we want to protect? And and I think this is a really good start. Um, we want to add a layer to this that deals with economic input and also kind of pesticide philosophy. So if you want to use lower toxic methods or, you know, or you're okay with using traditional uh, chemical control, and we're not quite sure how to work that all in there together, but this is where we're trying to go with our future plans for our extension communication to the industry and also to the garden centers and the residents. And we know we have a very long road ahead of us, um, but the bottom line, and this is from our Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture, spot it. So we need people to know what it looks like in all of its life stages and identify it. Destroy it. Use recommended practices, don't use these you know, home remedies that some of the things people have done are scary and unbelievable. Um, report it. We have a reporting system through our Penn State website. Uh, most states have a reporting system, whether through their university or through their Department of Agriculture, but report it. If you report it into the Penn State system and it's from another state, it gets shared with that state. <clears throat> and don't move them around. We are really trying to keep it here on the East Coast to not get any further than it is and give the researchers time to come up with even more management options. Of course, we have tons of information on our website. Under that Manage button, we have some videos that we recorded this spring that are on demand. So if you have other people that you think need to learn about Lanternfly, they're like 20 minute segments. So there's a seven different options there. And I just have a whole lot of people that I'm working with and, and to thank. I really appreciate all their support. And I'm gonna turn it over for questions. Great, thank you so much, Emily. That was excellent. Um, we had a few questions coming in during the course of your presentation, but you answered a lot of them, so very thorough. Um, but one that came from two folks, Jen and Philip, um, is can you speak, um, to the impact that was found uh, for Christmas tree growers, so regarding the um, economic study that you mentioned in the very beginning, why was that impact 
uh, what it was if spotted lanternfly doesn't attack conifers. Sure, yes, yeah, spotted lanternfly does not like conifers, but they will lay eggs on them. So uh, the problem is the concern that Christmas trees are shipped. And there was one case where a Christmas tree was harvested in an infested area of Pennsylvania. It was shipped into a not infested area of New Jersey. And when the eggs uh, got into the warm weather, the warm climate of the house, they hatched. And then the first instar nymphs that come out of the eggs are really tiny and they're not going to really be able to feed on that tree and survive. So they would die in a day or so. But that got into the media, into social media, and it turned into a huge public relations problem for our Christmas tree growers. Um, so we are trying to help people understand that the Christmas tree growers are doing all they can to keep the lanternflies from laying eggs on their trees in their fields. So they're using perimeter sprays, they're getting rid of tree of heaven, um, and then they're inspecting trees before they're loading them onto their truck. And that's all part of the quarantine. They have to do that to be in compliance. So um, the, the biggest problem for Christmas tree growers is in that quarantine side of that three bubble drawing. Thank you. Um, another common theme in some of the questions, I guess uh, there's a lot of interest um, with the fungal control. You mentioned Bavaria bassiana. Um, is there anywhere you recommend that folks who are interested in more information, perhaps uh, some of Dr. Hayek's work, uh, where, where they can find more info? Right. Um, Dr. Hayek has a paper out on it. Uh, I can't off the top of my head remember which journal it's in, but um, the other place to find out information about this specific, like future, in the future, what we're doing, on our Penn State website, there's a section um, about experimentation that's going on at Blue Marsh. Blue Marsh is public lands that are uh, it's state game lands, there's um, uh, Army Corps of Engineer lands, and it's, and it's a big acreage site that uh, has a lake on it. But in that park, there are rows, like tree lines, between the conservation field strips. And in those tree lines, there are a lot of uh, tree of heaven and, and spotted lanternfly. The picture I showed you of the tree of heaven that had like a lean to its trunk with hundreds of egg masses on it, that is from that site. So um, uh, Cornell and Penn State and uh, you know these other agencies that own the land are, are all uh, collaborating to, um, to apply Bavaria bassiana registered products and see what happens this summer, see if we can make it, you know, if it, it can work for us. Um, it will be done as ground applications and also some aerial applications. So there's a lot of information about that work on the Penn State website. We're trying to do everything we can to keep the public informed about the intent, the steps, and, um, you know, the schedule of it and, and, you know, because it's this big public park. So I think that's a good place to go for more information. Great, thank you. Um, and probably one last quick question because I need some time to explain the credit process, but you mentioned when scraping egg masses um, into a container that contains alcohol, um, is scraping them into a container with say um, soapy water also effective at killing them? Um, probably, but uh, everybody's saying use the alcohol because then if somehow, you know, the bag gets, if they get out of the bag somehow, the alcohol will definitely kill them and pretty quickly. So rubbing alcohol um, right from the drugstore, 70% is fine. It's inexpensive. Um, you can use hand sanitizer. I know that's hard to find these days. Um, if you don't have some alcohol, you can smash the eggs or double bag the eggs, you could put them in soapy water, but our recommendations suggest using alcohol is the best, surest thing. All right, well, thank you so much. Excellent presentation, Emily, and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for hosting me.
Absolutely. All right. Well, we'll switch back over because um, we're just about out of time here and get to the slides to discuss um, the credit process here. So um, just some reminders about those of you looking for uh, association credits. Um, we have uh, the availability of uh, a half credit for our mass certified arborists. So if you can fill out your webinar confirmation form for MCAs at the website shown here on your screen. Uh, the same process goes for Massachusetts certified landscape professionals to please fill out the webinar confirmation form at your respective website. 